Now we're going to start talking about chemical kinetics, which is the fancy phrase for the study of the rates of chemical reactions. How fast do chemical reactions go and what can we learn from it? Now, of course, when we talk about rate, it means how fast. And usually when we talk about the rate or how fast, we're talking about the change in something over the change in time. So when you're talking about how fast you're going, you're talking about the change in distance over the change in time. In a reaction, it's the amounts of the substances change. So the rate of reaction is simply the change in the amount of substance over the change in time. Now to make it a little bit more straightforward, we talk about concentration in terms of the amounts of the substances. So the rate of reaction is going to be the change in concentration over the change in time. To make it even more straightforward at this level, we talk about concentration in terms of molarity. So the rate of reaction is the change in molarity over the change in time. Now it's going to get really tedious if we keep talking about molarity, molarity, molarity all the time. So the symbolism we use for molarity is we simply put whatever we're talking about, the substance we're talking about in square brackets, as you see here, and we read that as being the moles of X for every litre. Okay, so the molarity, the concentration of X expressed in these square brackets. So thus we can say the rate of reaction is going to be the change in the concentration of X, remember delta means change, over the change in time. Now, when we look at that, we say, well, as a reaction happens, the concentration of X changes. If we were to plot out the concentration of X on the vertical, so on the top, and T on the horizontal, well, then the slope of that line would be the rate of reaction. Now, that sounds really trivial, doesn't it? Really easy. But as we will see in the next slide, even that funny little phrase, rate of reaction is the change in the concentration of the change in time, and the rate of reaction is the slope of the graph of the concentration against time. A little bit more complicated. So let's think about that graph of concentration against time. Let's start off by saying if X is a reactant. So if X is a reactant, it's going to start off with a concentration up here somewhere. And then as the time of the reaction goes along, we're going to be using up X. So the amount of X is going to decrease. Now, do you think that that decrease is going to be a nice straight line? I would be shocked if it was. Do you think it's going to go slowly at first, so not much change, and then plummet down? And the answer is no. What happens is that the concentration of X obviously starts somewhere up here, and it starts going down rather significantly at first. This is a rather steep slope here. But then as time goes along, it starts to level off. Okay, so that is what the graph of the concentration against time for reactants is going to look like. And of course, the rate of the reaction is the slope of this line. Well, good luck, what's the slope? Well, there are an infinite number of possible slopes that we could choose to describe the rate. So we would have to specify not just the slope of the line, but something special about that slope. For example, consider just a random time T1. We could take the slope of the line from the start of X going down to T1. And that's a straight line and we could define a slope. And that slope is a rate. And it would be the average rate with respect to the reactant between time zero and this time of T1. Okay, so that would be very akin to the idea of saying, well, if it's three miles for me to get to work and it took me um, 45 minutes to doing it, well, then my average speed was three miles in 45 minutes or four miles in an hour. Now, that's not saying, of course, that I went exactly at that same speed all the way through some of the uh, the walk is uphill, so I'll be going more slowly there. So I'm down here, so we go more quickly there. So you actually lose a lot of information when you take that average rate. It's not bad for using GPS. It is particularly poor for studying the rate of chemical reactions. So you say, okay, well, what I'll do is I will define my slope as being the tangent to the graph, so a T1. So in other words, I take the graph at T1 and I draw the tangent to it, so it's just touching the graph at T1. And then I could say, well, the slope of this line is the instantaneous rate with respect to the reactant at time T. 
or jolly good. Of course, as we'll talk about in a minute, there's nothing special about time t. But the instantaneous rate gives us a lot more information about what's happening there. Of course, it has absolutely no information about what's going on anywhere else other than presumably the rate would be bigger before time t and smaller after time t. So you can see we've got some issues, and that's just talking about the reactants. Well, of course, the concentration can apply to the products as well as the reactants. So let's change it so that now X is a product. Well, if X is a product, we start off with none of it at the start. We'd start making it rather quickly, and then that would slow off, slow off, slow off in a way that is obviously symmetrical with respect to the reactants. Okay, And again, if we think about time t, we have that same issue. We can take the slope of the line between time of 0 and time of t1, and that would be the average rate with respect to the products between 0 and t1. Or we can do the instantaneous rate with respect to the product at t1. Okay, Infinite number of possible ways in which we can express the rate. Well, by convention, to allow chemists to talk to each other about the rate of this reaction versus the rate of that reaction, the way that we will do it is we always do it to define the rate with respect to reactants, and we define it as the instantaneous rate with respect to reactant at the start of the reaction. So we plot that nice little curve, right, the purple curve of the concentration of the reactants against time, and then we draw the tangent to the line right at that time zero. So in other words, it's the initial speed. Every reaction has an initial rate, and so in order that we may compare the rates of one reaction to the rates of another reaction, that is how we measure the rate. So every time from now on, when I say rate of reaction, I'm just talking about the initial instantaneous rate with respect to one of the reactants. Of course, there's a little issue there. First of all, which reactant? But secondly, think about the experimental aspects of this. If you're going to plot the concentration of X of some species against time, you have to be able to measure time. Well, that's not hard. But you also have to be able to measure the concentration of this substance X. And you can't just look at a reaction and say, oh, look, there's 10, there's 9, there's 8, there's 7 concentrations of whatever we're talking about. There has to be something physical that we can measure. It might be color, because as concentrations change, color changes. It might be, if there's an acid or a base involved, pH. It might be volume, if there is a gas involved. But there has to be something we can measure in order for us to determine the concentration of some species X. And in a reaction, maybe the reactants aren't things I can measure. It's the product that has that physical um, factor that we can measure. Okay, So a lot of times experimentally, we can't just measure the concentration of the reactant. We have to measure the concentration of a product and then try to convert it to the concentration of the reactant. Well, can we do that? And the answer is, of course we can, because reactions uh, involve species that are related. The reactants are related to the products by stoichiometry. For example, let's think about this nice simple reaction here. 2H2O2 goes to 2H2O plus O2. What this is telling us is that when two moles of H2O2 come together, they will make two moles of H2O and one mole of O2. Every time I make water, I use up an H2O2. Every time I make an oxygen, I use up two H2O2s. That's what that stoichiometry is telling us. And with that, I hope you would appreciate that as there is a relationship between the amounts that are changing of these species, there is also a relationship between the rates. If we were to plot out X against time for the concentration of H2O2, it would, of course, look like that H2O2. It's a reactant. And we could say that the rate of the reaction is equal to the change in the concentration of H2O2 with respect to the change in time. If I was to instead plot out the H2O, it would look like that. And of course, there's a relationship between those two because as reactants go down, products go up. And in this particular case, because the H2O2 and the H2O 
are in a one-to-one -one relationship as the H2O goes down the H2O as the H2O2 goes down the H2O goes up we can express the rate in terms of the H2O2 but I could also express the rate in terms of the concentration of H2O as well by saying rate is concentration of H2O over the change in time and again and I hope I haven't repeated it too much here because every time an H2O gets used up and every time an H2O2 gets used up and H2O gets made I can say that the rate with respect to H2O2 is the same as the rate with respect to H2O I use up 2 I make 2 I use up 10 I make 10 okay now of course there is actually something missing there because change is a scalar quality quantity there's a vector quantity excuse me if the change means you get an increase it's a positive change if the change means that you get a decrease it is a negative change and of course in our reactions here the H2O2 is being used up so it's a negative change this is a negative number the H2O is being made so this is a positive number so in order to truly have this equal we have to change the sign of the rate with respect to the H2O2 reactants by definition have a negative rate so when we talk about them we have to change the sign of it okay you don't say that I came to school at 30 miles an hour so I went home at minus 30 miles an hour you obviously put in something so that you always have a positive number for your rate now think about the O2 that's what this would look like because every time I make an O2 I make two H2O's every time I make an O2 I use up two H2O2's okay because the coefficient of H2O is half that of the hydrogen peroxide and the water because the coefficient of the O2 is half that of the hydrogen peroxide and the water the rate of the O2 will be half the rate of the other ones okay and so in order to get that right I would have to say the rate of the H2O2 is half of the rate of H2O and of course the rate of H2O was minus the rate of the H2O2 so I could have that relationship in there as well the relationship between rates expressed in terms of different substances comes directly from the stoichiometry of the equation and so if I put out a general one AA plus BB goes to CC plus DD well then I can express the rate in terms of the concentrations of A the concentrations of B the concentrations of C the concentrations of D there is the relationship between them expressed as if we want to normalize it as one over the coefficient okay because in this case here the O2 was half of the H2O the rate of the O2 is half of the rate of the H2O okay that 2 comes from the coefficient of the H2O and of course the 1 comes from the invisible coefficient of the O2 to make that normalized we just say 1 over the coefficient of A times the rate with respect to A equals 1 over the coefficient of B with respect to the rate of B equals 1 over the coefficient of C with respect to C which is equal to 1 over the coefficient of D times the rate with respect to D and of course reactants we make negative so that all of these numbers are nice positive numbers now that was much longer than we really should and needed to spend on defining the rate and the relative rates but I did want to try and get you thinking in the right way about the speed of the reactions okay now what we're going to be discussing to different extents are factors that will affect the rate of reaction first of all the phase of the reaction and the reactants is going to have a big effect on the rate reactions can take place between two solids but they're really slow conversely if you have reactants in the gas phase those gas molecules moving around randomly bumping into each other much 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 faster reactions in the gas phase in the solid if you use the two solids for the reaction or you have the reaction between a solid and a liquid or a solid and solution if you use chunks that are solid it will be much slower than if you use the solid as a powder because as a powder you much have, have a much higher surface area exposed to the other reactants
Concentration of the reactants usually affects the rate of the reaction in such that the more of the reactants you have, the faster the rate. Intuitively, that makes sense. The temperature affects the rate of reaction. As the temperature goes up, the rate goes up. And the reason for that, and we'll talk about this a bit later, is that, of course, as the temperature goes up, the molecules are moving around more quickly. Therefore, it is more probable that they will be able to have a reaction. And we will briefly talk about something called a catalyst that, of course, speeds up the reaction. Now, the first two of those we're just going to take as red in here. We're going to focus extensively in the next video on how the concentration of the reactants affects the rate. And then in a later video, we'll talk about temperature and catalyst.